Good morning. Uh, for the purposes of being formal here as an introduction, Dr. Scali and the members of the Reynolds Grant Foundation have asked me to prepare a lecture on geriatric trauma. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say it's an honor to be even included in the speaker forum since you've known the people that have preceded me are of the highest caliber, namely people like Dr. Espinosa, Tamasca, and D'Ambrosio. So this is something that I don't take lightly and to prepare it on a, a level that will reach both students, residents, and interns is quite a challenge. So I thank Dr. Scali for giving me the opportunity and if you don't know, he's involved in this Reynolds Grant project that is going to try to cross bridges between emergency medicine and geriatrics so we can come up with a core curriculum and a simulated patient in the future. So there's a lot of work going on between EM and geriatrics and Dr. Scali has been instrumental in that. So I thank him again for giving me the opportunity. My particular lecture, geriatric trauma, I brought into a subset of trauma and falls in the elderly patient to give you an idea of what patients present with that are in the geriatric population group. And for purposes of disclaimer, this is basically in cooperation with the Institute for Aging, Successful Aging, and the Emergency uh, Medicine Department of UMDNJ slash Kennedy Health System. So we're going to start off with some cases since you have your little uh, pads in front of you here to give you a flavor of what to expect and then we'll go over the various uh, presentations in the lecture itself. So pretty much self-explanatory, 78-year-old male, a slip and fall type injury while walking with his wife, landed on his backside. He presents the ED with moderate to severe low back pain. X-rays were taken. And these are the X-rays. Reproducing better than I thought. There's a little blurring there on the right one, but this was the X-ray. Okay, X-ray sh shows an L3 compression fracture with greater than 50% loss of axial height. After implementing appropriate pain management, the next step would be which of the following? Bone scan of the spine, nasal calcitonin, walker, CT of the lumbar spine, and physical therapy consult. So, overwhelming CT of the lumbar spine. Which is the correct answer? What is that, 63%? Shows 50% of loss of height. The next step would be CT. We'll talk about this, but the inference is that uh, loss of axial height may require further imaging to look for retropulsion fragments into the spinal canal and or neurologic deficit. But we're talking about here uh, CT. Second case, a 79-year-old woman presented to the ED after a ground level fall on her left side. Uh, the emergency department presentation revealed left knee pain and hip pain, but she could ambulate with moderate assistance. Uh, there was no gross deformity, there was no internal external rotation, no loss of limb uh, uh, length, and no external rotation. Plain films were obtained. Left knee pain, left hip pain conventional film we use all the time. X-rays were read as negative. A walker was obtained, the patient was discharged to follow up with primary care. Uh, if the pain did not improve in the next five to seven days to return. She presented to her primary care physician three days later with worsening pain and now unable to walk. She was spent, sent back to the emergency department for re-examination and additional studies. What is required at this point? A, referral to physical therapy because of the pain. B, increased pain medication. C, MRI of the hip. D, an orthopedic consult. E, x-rays of the knee joint since that wasn't done initially. And overwhelmingly, x-ray the knee joint, not overwhelmingly, 50% versus MRI of the hip. And the answer is the MRI of the hip. Okay. Remember, we over-treat the young and the old. If an older person has a complaint that doesn't fit, you have to pursue the investigation much more than you would a person not of uh, an older age group. And we've talked about this ad nauseum. Over-treat the young and the old, and that'll be part of one of the caveats of this lecture, is that you give the geriatric population more credence than you would the ordinary population group. And there's the MRI, which shows the fracture line, and we see this over and over again. People that have ostensibly a negative hip 
and then have either protracted pain, hopefully in the emergency room visit initially, but pain over a period of time as in this case, which would necessitate further imaging. Another case, 78-year-old female was brought in uh, from a fall on a step ladder, trying to change a light bulb at home. She suddenly lost her balance, fell forward, landing directly on her face. Physical exam reported facial pain, headache, neck pain, and is found to have a quadriparasis with significant greater upper extremity weakness and sensory loss than the lower extremities. After immediate mobilization of the patient's C-spine, the next step would be CT of the head, CT facial bone, transfer to trauma center, MRI of the C-spine, CT of the C-spine. And CT of the C-spine. For the residents here, this is sort of an inherent philosophy that we follow. Unknown loss or unknown mechanism or a known mechanism with head injury, we always get the head and neck. So this is not to be totally surprising in the results. Okay, so those were a little bit of snippets into what I wanted to approach as far as an overall assessment of geriatric trauma in particular falls, but it's just one of many subsets that we're going to uh, cover in the scope of the discussion. Physiology of the geriatric trauma patient is important because you have to know what's different about older population groups that you're treating that are not the same in your normal run of the mill. Sources of geriatric trauma we'll uh, review and discuss. Triage protocols pretty much are going to be the same except for hypervigilance, which I've alluded to before. You have to give the geriatric patient a little bit more credibility when it comes to trauma than the ordinary run-of-the-mill, quote, normal patient. Why is this important? Because you're going to start to see older patients more and more and more. The statistics show that the, quote, super geriatric patient group, greater than 85 years of uh, age or older, will double in the next 20 years as far as their visits to the emergency department. And that is a daunting task because we work in situations now where we see a number of senior citizens because of the nursing home proclivity at Cherry Hill. But as the population ages and the baby boomers increase and the volume of these patients make it to older age groups, their scenarios will be more and more presenting to the emergency department than ever before. They project that 23% of all trauma patients are geriatric in origin, and that number is scheduled to double in the next 30 years. So when you think about it, one in two, when you are in your prime of practice, will be geriatric population-based trauma patients. You have to know and have a reference point for what they need more so than the normal population group. You also have to know the severity of trauma in geriatrics three times the mortality level, three times the mortality level than the normal population group. So they're in a higher index of suspicion from the get-go, and your job is to try to sift through and figure out what that pr presentation entails. Case in point, this gentleman, triathlete, 68 years old, okay? I couldn't do one of these classifications, okay, whether it's the 2.4 swimming, the bike of 112 miles, or the marathon. Illustrates that the seniors are not just sedentary. And he did it in 11 hours. The fact that he did it is an amazement to me, period. But it shows you that as seniors go on and as we prolong their quality of life, either through medications, through physical therapy, through preventive measures, they're seeking to achieve things that we never entailed in our particular lifetimes, and they're doing it well. I mean, this is an exaggeration of a point, but it's a point still. Okay, so the baseline geriatric approach. You have to know that as people age, their ability to react to trauma or to react to any type of environmental stress differs because of the aging process itself. The heart is not the same, the lungs are not the same, the central nervous system is not the same, the bones are not the same. So you have to sort of inherently give them that baseline. And not only because of the normal aging process, but other comorbidities such as hypertension, CAD, diabetes, osteoporosis. Not to mention the third disclaimer here, or bullet, 
polypharmacy. You cannot assume anything on a geriatric patient who comes in with 15 or 16 medications on board. Vital signs mean nothing. A lot of these patients are on calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, digitalis, that will blunt any type of response to a normal stimulus, be it adverse or not. So you can't just use vital signs to try to assess hypovolemia or hypoperfusion or any type of shocky state or any type of septic state. They just don't respond with the same type of vital signs that you're used to seeing. Under the heart or cardiovascular uh, concerns, decreased reserve. Most geriatric patients over the age of 65 have lost a lot of their cardiac reserve. Their cardiac function is down. Their cardiac index is down. Their ability to respond to stress is down. Normally, they'll try to increase their systemic vascular resistance in order to combat things like hypotension. But sometimes they can't because they're compromised by many of the medications that they're taking vis-a-vis -vis the calcium channel blocker, beta blockers, and whatnot. So they don't have the ability to tolerate stress, such as trauma, as well as you and I do, or in this case, as well as you can. Hypovolemia is common, okay? We get a nursing home population group at Cherry Hill that baseline BUNs are double, baseline creatinines are double, in addition to whatever the stressor was that brought them to the ED, a fall, a trip, an inadvertent head injury and they start off compromised. Couple that with the medication issue and then the underlying disease processes of aging and you see why it's multifactorial on how do you approach these patients from a baseline point of view. I brought this slide in because it mentions some of the tenets of myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction has a number of subsets as defined in this article that came out in 2007. But you, I bring you to this point here, type 2. And type 2 is really what the geriatric population group is subjected to. Issues secondary to ischemia but not directly related to CAD. Hypoperfusion, hypovolemia, dehydration, things that can cumulatively cumulatively lead to ischemic events, they're not atherogenesis in origin. So I tell you that because, again, you have to think preventively to try to get these patients assessed adequately and certainly completely. Back to physiology, the pulmonary system. How many of the patients you hear COPD history, reactive airway disease history, pulmonary hypertension, asbestosis, these are situations that decrease the ability of that individual to fight stressors, okay? If they have poor lung compliance, if they have decreased mucociliary clearance, they're set up for aspiration, they're set up for infection, they're set up for all things that heretofore that patient that is not a geriatric patient in age is predisposed to. Then you move up the ladder in the respiratory tract and you look at uh, laryngeal reflexes when you're going to intubate someone or think of intubating that patient, what things do you have to look for or anticipate? The edentulous patient, the anterior portion of the uh, neck patient that they're impossible to intubate. You have an 80-year-old female that looks seemingly benign, body weight of 120 to 30 pounds. You can't find the airway. They're so anterior. It happened to me many a time. But you have to think preventatively with these patients before you can even approach trying to help them. Last, on this particular slide, which I'll elaborate further, rib fractures. Rib fractures in geriatric patients is not a benign entity. I can't stress that enough. We get a number of these patients that come in, have two, one or two rib fractures, and they're blown off as seemingly benign. Incentive spirometry, incentive spirometry pain medications, discharge. That is a formula for disaster. Not to mention things that come up that are indirect sequelae of rib fractures, but rib fractures in and of, themse in and of themselves is a non-benign process. It sets up the patient for a lot of complication issues that you do not pick up initially, but we pick up later on, the least of which is a pulmonary contusion, the most extreme of which is respiratory failure. Osseous structures in the geriatric patient. We're not even talking about the trauma yet. We're just talking about all the predisposing factors that make trauma such a difficult issue in uh, geriatrics. They all have some degree of osteoporosis. 
pelvic fractures are pretty much common. And they don't have to have a tremendous mechanism for it. Standing and falling to the ground, common issue. The most common fracture is usually the rami, which is okay in the sense that there's no casting or no surgical intervention, but they're painful, they're disabling. Hip fractures, we've all known that hip fractures, once in, they present to a geriatric patient, is a death knell down the road, up to 13% in the first year of mortality, secondary to a hip fracture. S spinal canal or spinal column injuries, they're all predisposed to arthritic conditions, spondylitic injuries, spondylitic predispositions, which with minimal or no trauma, even indirectly, can produce pro uh, problems. We all see the head issue. The person comes in with blood head trauma, no neck pain, nothing referable to the C-spine. We get a CT and he's got a C2 fracture. Happens many a time with no pain in the area whatsoever. Or an isolated odontoid process fracture. Happens very frequently. Too frequently to be missed. Now we were talking about wedge fractures and compression fractures. The reason I bring this and highlight this is because there are a lot of fallacies concerning wedge fractures. If it's a wedge fracture and it's not 25% uh, or 50% and loss of axial height is pretty benign. Not so. 20% of wedge fractures can turn out to be burst fractures. 20%. So you don't follow this up with some type of more sophisticated imaging such as a CT or MRI and you have retropulsion fragments into the spinal canal you have a neuro sequelae that's not reversible. My point is any type of fracture in the geriatric patient that involves this type of deformity, you get more advanced imaging. Okay, get more advanced imaging. Treat the elderly with a higher index of suspicion, an ongoing theme that goes throughout the lecture. Treat the elderly with a higher index of suspicion. Speaking of hips and bones, I find that that number is a little on the low side. I've missed more hip fractures on conventional studies than 9%, but those are the numbers that come out of most of the journals. Even that, if you miss 10 out of 100, you're not batting too well in any league, let alone emergency medicine. 75% of them occur in an older population group. The problem is with these, the comorbidities are staggering and Increased mortality inevitably follows hip fractures in the geriatric population, 12 to 25 percent in year one. So these are injuries that are associated with other comorbidities that are life-threatening. And we also all see the patients that are incapacitated with a hip fracture and then come back with PEs or come back with a thromboembolic phenomenon. That's just one of many because of the sedentary sequelae that are forced upon a patient because of having a hip fracture. A little bit of an easy diagram to follow. Hip pain, conventional film, conventional film is negative. You still have an indication, in a pain out of proportion to the exam, or something that just doesn't sit right with you with the patient. Well then pursue that, either through MRI or at the minimum a CT. And there's nothing to stop you from admitting a patient for observation and pain control when the picture doesn't fit, if they clinically have pain out of proportion to the exam, and you can't find it through conventional radiography, pursue it. Pursue it. Okay, even if radiology gives you a song and dance about why you're ordering a CT on the hip with a negative film, you tell them why. The patient clinically looks like a fracture and I want to get some more information. And if really you get nowhere, admit and give them absolute bed rest and treat them like a hip fracture. We talked about bone, heart, lung. Well, the central nervous system is another at-risk category. As patients get older, their brains start to shrink. They start to get atrophy, okay? They get predisposed to bridging type injuries because there's a potential space there that's not usually there in a non-atrophied brain. So they're more likely to bleed. Couple that with the fact that a lot of these patients are on anticoagulants like Coumadin, and then your risk stratification strategy goes off the wall. Couple that with the fact that patients in the geriatric population group are slow to respond to trauma. Their reflexes have been slowed, if not non-existent. Their gaits are sometimes altered. So a, a simple fall is not usually a simple fall anymore. 
Overtreat the elderly. Overtreat the el mechanism of injury unknown. They found on the floor. That person has to be scanned. Uh, there's no there's no issue there. People that don't do that are just giving this geriatric group not the full benefit of an emergency room visit. And it's not anything esoteric. A CT of the head and neck takes five minutes. You miss it, they're paralyzed for life. Or worse, if they have an intracerebral bleed, they're compromised for life. One of the interesting factors about intracerebral bleeding in the geriatric population is that the dura is usually fixed to the bone. So the likelihood of epidural hematomas is lower, but the subdural hematoma and the intracere intracerebral bleed or intraparenchymal bleed is high on your list. I can't remember an epidural in a person of over 65 years of age, but a ton of subdurals. And that's because of the door adhering to the uh, bony architecture of the skull. Hyperextension injury, mechanism, fall, central cord syndrome, they can't, uh, they're uh, weaker on the upper extremity rather than the lower, neurological or neurosurgical emergency, more predisposed because of degenerative joint disease of the elderly, poor uh, osteopenia or osteoporosis of the elderly, things that let them be more likely to have a more severe injury from a osseous point of view. And the osseous protects the spinal cord, obviously. Now, sources of trauma. I tried to get it down into the three most common areas of where people manifest geriatric trauma, first of which is a fall. 50% of trauma patients in the geriatric population fall. And we're not talking about falls from like out the second story window. Uh, geriatric patients need minimal trauma to cause damage. Okay, a simple fall from a standing height can break a rib, can break a pelvis, can break a hip, can cause a subdural. Okay, so we're not talking about major mechanisms here. We're talking about anything that result in a traumatic incident from a fall. The etiology of which is uh, a myriad of causes. We have that change in mental status, syncope type workup. Is it arrhythmogenic? Is it hypovolemic? Is it septic? Is it electrolytic? Or does it come under that broad category of some type of encephalopathy that we haven't been able to figure out yet? Is it endocrine? So there are a multiplicity of etiologies here. But the point is that the mechanism doesn't have to be all that substantial. And be careful with that. Couple the fact that people that fall once or twice have a higher incidence of falling again, up to 50%. So it's not in the, the uh, order sheet from the emergency point of view, meaning the emergency department, but these are the people that need to be set up for physical therapy, set up for preventive dietary uh, measures such as changing diets with high vitamin D, and prophylactic preventative measures for future cessation or prevention of falls. MVAs. I think this first bullet is the most sobering. People over 65 have the second highest incident of crashes per mile driven. And if you're lucky enough to get to this level, they're the highest. Okay? Again, what mechanisms? It's not all arrhythmogenic. They have slower response to stimuli. Okay, they have slower responses to any kind of insult. The fatality rate is astronomical, one in five, seven times that of the normal, quote, population group or younger population group. So you're talking about someone that comes in of the geriatric population with an MVA. You better scrutinize them head to toe and over-treat the chief complaint. And you can see that the incidence is not weather related. It's not day or night related. Most of them happen during the day. Most of them happen within two to three miles of the patient's residence and good weather. Again, the multiplicity of comorbidity in the geriatric population does not bode well for them driving and having an MVA and the sequelae of which is not good. Couple this with a geriatric population group walking and being the proverbial moped. 
What's interesting is this bullet here. I'll skip to it. To go through a crosswalk, you have to have a rate of four feet per second. Some of us in this room, myself included, couldn't do that quickly, let alone someone who is a 65-year-old or if you go into that exclusive category of 85-year-olds, you can't get through a crosswalk adequately, yet that's the standard we use. It wouldn't be a reach then to think that this number is coming to 50%. When they get hit, as Dr. Pachati was alluding to to a patient last night, they are seriously injured. Seriously injured. And the higher the age group, the higher index of suspicion. I don't know how many times I could mention this this morning, but it's the theme that runs through the entire discussion. Overtreat the geriatric population base. We'll talk about just some isolated instances. Burns. Patients overwhelmingly get burned at home. It's not something that's intrinsic to an outside mechanism. Some of these patients can't feel as well. They may have their hand on a skillet or on a uh, heating device and not even know they're burned. Some patients use heating blankets and can't tolerate or can't understand or have the tolerance to appreciate when it's too high. But these are very, very high mortality rates because, again, geriatric populations do not have the reserve to combat hypovolemia in a major burn, sepsis in a major burn, electrolytic disturbances in a major burn. The comorbidities just do not get them through the crisis. That's why the high mortality rate. Okay, this brings us to one of the interesting features of the talk, rib injuries. 80-year-old Mr. T tripped in his bathroom, fell, hitting the right side of his chest against the, bath, against the bathtub and come to the ER, ER holding his right <coughs> rib area. Chest x-ray revealed three non-displaced rib fractures on the right without any pneumo, pleural fusion or pulmonary contusion. So basically just isolated rib fractures. Your plan, a rib binder, narcotics, incentive spirometry, send them home. Non-narcotic medication with a follow-up Hospital admission, pain control, incentive spirometry, four-hour observation, lidoderm patch, outpatient physical therapy. Maybe some of what I'm saying is getting to you, or maybe you've heard this before, but rib injuries, multiple rib fractures, are setups for disaster. Okay, so the answer correctly is hospital admission, pain control, incentive spirometry, and look for other injuries. Okay, you don't get that classic chest x-ray of pulmonary contusion acutely in the emergency department. It could take up to six to eight hours to develop. That doesn't mean that they don't have a pulmonary injury. It just means you don't see it yet. And this slide here gives you the whole scope of why it's important to overtreat rib injuries in the elderly. You see there, 36% of the group had, just with an isolated rib fracture, pulmonary complications, approximately 10% of which were mortality driven. That's a lot for a single rib injury. And we're not talking about the rib injury that's over the spleen and you missed a splenic injury or the rib injury that's over the liver and you missed a liver contusion. But these are isolated segments that go on to develop problems. Delayed pneumothorax is another sequelae. Pneumonia from a lack of movement. When you have six or more or the whole right side of the chest pretty much is broken, they don't go to the floor. Okay, these are pulmonary disasters waiting to happen. Okay, they go to a higher level, preferably the ICU, or at least step down going to the ICU, because they will have something down the road that will take their life if you're not hypervigilant. <coughs> and we go, speaking of hypervigilance, we talk about over triage in the elderly. If the American College of Surgeons was a very stoic group, recommends that people that are 55 years of age or older go to a trauma center. That's telling you something. Unfortunately, in our area, that's not something that mechanism of injury or age predisposes the medics or the EMTs to follow. But it's a guideline from a college that's pretty revered when it comes to trauma care. And they state that 55 years is the cutoff for something of a trauma issue that they should go to trauma centers. If they're telling you that, then you can extrapolate that that's what should be 
in the 65, 75, or 85-year-old because the scenarios lend to badness. Chest contusions just don't become chest contusions. Pericardial fusions, cardiac tamponade, pulmonary contusions, PEs, pneumos, none of which geriatric population group will tolerate well. And we, we're going into an, the secondary issues when we talk about comorbidities. These patients have no reserve, either cardiac, pulmonary, central nervous system wise, bony wise. They're all subject to failing and not doing well when insulted with major trauma. Nothing here that's earth shattering. How do you manage these patients? There's still basics of the ABCs. Some little caveats come into play though as I alluded to before. If in doubt, don't wait for them to crash. You get a low pulse ox, you get a respiratory rate that's not right, don't wait for them to crash on you. Try to be proactive and get their airway secure before they go down on you. Anticipate that they're going to have a lot of problems. Either the tooth here, tooth there philosophy, where there's poor dental hygiene or uh, inability to access the airway properly to get a, a malampati mal score that's adequate, or the other extreme where they're edentulous and their mouth is like jello and everywhere you try to put an intubation uh, set up they bleed or they swell. I mean these are particular issues to the geriatric population. We see it in other population groups but more so. So don't be behind the eight ball. Try to be proactive. If you're thinking intubation and that is, goes across your mental screening of this patient, intubate them. You could always take the tube out later. If you lose the airway acutely, you'll never get it back. And from my experience, the, young, the younger population group is much easier to intubate than a 75-year-old, 100-pound lady. They're real anterior. When you do see their airway, if you're lucky enough, it's the size of a thimble. And I'm known in the, in the uh, units as number six because that's all I use on these patients. Because you can't get a seven and a half, you can't get an eight, it's impossible. So when six is referred to in the nomenclature of ICU parlance, that is me. Do I care? No. You have a six tube in a patient, the next morning they make rounds in pulmonary, you put a desolate Hoffman guide wire through the six, pull the six out and put whatever tube you want in. It's not rocket science, but we get criticized repeatedly for putting small tubes in. Put a seven and a half in a geriatric patient, they won't be able to talk again because you've ripped their cords. Go follow up a patient that you intubate in the emergency department and see what sequela you've created. It's not heartening at all. When you go in, they're fine, but they can't speak. So I take the more conservative approach, put in whatever gives them oxygen and doesn't destroy what they had before. It's very cavalier to go in there, put an eight, it goes in kind of snug. You feel that it wasn't just quite the size, but it got in there and then you don't see what the sequelae is of what you did. Hypoperfusion requires aggressive management, of course, but remember, you're hypoperfusing a patient that's already compromised and can't build up a systemic vascular resistance, they can't have a good cardiac index because of pre-existing illness or of just the aging process. Sometimes they won't tolerate fluids the way you and I would tolerate fluids, and you have to anticipate that. The converse of that is giving them too much fluid and throwing them into a sequelae of failure or respiratory distress for which you have to intubate anyway. But if you're thinking down the road, and this is a difficult person to manage from a fluid standpoint, tube them. At least you've taken the lungs out of the mix. That doesn't become an issue. If you overload them, you can control their breathing. The other way, it's difficult if you throw someone to acute congestive heart failure and then you try to rescue them. I'm aggressive. One of the few things I'll be aggressive with is intubation on any level, but more so with geriatric population group because they need to have that vigilance and anticipatory philosophy that we don't reserve for other kinds of patients. The young and the old, we talked about this morning, the young and the old get overtreated. can't use vital signs. To me, they're irrelevant unless they're ostensibly right, way off the, uh, the chart. We've had many patients with hemoglobins of five come in with a heart rate of 65. 
why. They're on 18 different medications. Five of them are going to affect the heart rate. So look for other reasons other than vital signs clinically. Are they blue? Are they cold? Are they showing any signs of hypoperfusion that doesn't uh, relate to vital signs? It's nice when the heart rate's 180, or the pulse oximetry is 88%, or the respiratory rate's 28. You know, everybody has a respiratory rate of 20 in the ER. No one has abnormal respiratory rates. But look for other predisposing factors. You don't have to get a lactate level back. The person looks toxic. You know they're hyperperfusing. You have to be aggressive with resuscitation. In spite of what I told you, as far as throwing them to failure or overcompensating because of their many lack of uh, physiologic responses, you have to be aggressive. Excuse me. And if that requires intubating them first, intubate them first. You can throw all the blood products you want in. You can go with any kind of resuscitative measure you want. But at least you've controlled one of the parameters that can get you in trouble, namely the pulmonary system. And that will throw you into a hassle if you can't control at least one of those parameters. You can control the other two. You can give fluids or withhold fluids. You can give pressors or withhold pressors. But you can't do much to the pulmonary tree if it's not protected. Basically, those are the subtopics that we went through. Questions? This is a very, very, very brief overview of trauma and the approach to the geriatric patient with trauma. Key points, pulmonary issues are never trivial. Rib fractures specifically are things that you have to be on board with from the get-go and anticipate problems. Fractures of the C-spine, L-spine, T-spine, especially the T and L-spine that uh, are, quote, wedge, are not benign. You have to pursue them a little bit more vigorously and think of retropulsion all the time, regardless of the percentage, regardless of the axial height. Overtreat the geriatric population group. Protect the airway first, paramount, and then work backward. And always look for underlying signs of problems that don't reflect themselves in vital signs. That's it in a nutshell. Thank you.